Hi, welcome back. Today we're going to go deeper into syntactic rules and we're going to study how we use syntactic rules to generate and to analyze sentences. And then we're going to talk about some of the really interesting patterns that emerge when we start using these syntactic rules to analyze languages. Okay. So remember that syntax is the study of the structure of sentences, how words combine together to form phrases and sentences. A sentence is grammatical if it follows the rules that you know implicitly as a native speaker of a language. There's two kinds of constraints. There are co-occurrence constraints and there are word order constraints. These two constraints, these two kinds of constraints are summarized in syntactic rules. Syntactic rules, which are also called phrase structure rules, are these little things that describe these syntactic constraints. So for example, a syntactic rule looks like this. This says the category S for sentence can consist of a noun phrase NP followed by a verb phrase VP. The category sentence can consist of an NP followed by a VP. And the rules that specify individual words, which realize syntactic categories, are called lexical entries. Those are the things like this, which you would read as the category N can consist of the word cat, and so on. Now, last time, we worked pretty hard to develop this set of syntactic rules, which describe the syntax of the English language. So we have rules defining what a sentence is, we have rules, very many rules, describing what a verb phrase VP is. And we have a bunch of rules touching on noun phrases, nouns, prepositional phrases, and so on. This also, by the way, if you have the textbook, you can find this list of rules on page 232 of that book. So we have here rules for sentences. We have rules for verb phrases. We have rules for noun phrases and for nouns and prepositional phrases. So what do we do with these rules? What are syntactic rules good for? How do you use them? How do you test that they are correct rather than incorrect? So you can apply these rules in two ways. The first is called generation. In generation, the goal is to generate a random sentence of the language. So to do this, you start with the S symbol for sentence, and you randomly choose rules to follow until you've generated a sentence. The rules of a language should be made so that when you do this generation process, you can generate all of the grammatical sentences in a language, and you don't generate any ungrammatical sentences. So if you have the right set of rules, you'll generate all the grammatical sentences and none of the ungrammatical sentences. Parsing is the opposite of generation. Parsing is when you start with a sentence, a list of words, and you figure out how that sentence could have been generated by following the rules. In other words, you're drawing a syntactic tree, a phrase structure tree for the sentence. Now, you can think of these syntactic rules kind of like a machine. It's a machine that you can run in forward or in reverse. So running it forward is generation. That's like you're turning the crank forward. When you run the crank forward, then you start with S and you apply the rules and at the end you generate a sentence. Turning the crank backwards the other way is parsing. That's when you start with a sentence and you figure out how the rules could have generated that sentence starting initially from an S. And we're going to look at examples of both of these things, both parsing and generation. So. We're going to do a generation example first. Remember, generation means we're turning the crank forward. That means we're going to be following the arrows in the rules. So the way you start is always with the symbol S for sentence. A syntactic tree should always have S on top because it always describes a complete sentence. OK, so we have an S. Now, remember, we can read these rules like an S can consist of an NP followed by a VP and a VP can consist of a V, and so on. So right now we've just have an S so far. Are there any rules we can use to expand this? So let's look at our list of rules. Are there any rules where we see S on the left-hand side of the rule? 
So in fact, there's only one rule for S, so far at least. And it is that an S can consist of an NP followed by a VP. So we don't really have a choice here. The only thing we can do with an S is expand it into an NP followed by a VP. Okay, now let's look at the NP and the VP and we'll see if we can expand them into anything bigger. So looking at our NP rules, we see that an NP can consist of a debt followed by an N or an NP can consist of a prop N. Those are two rules which are applicable to the NP that we have here. Let's just choose one randomly. We'll just randomly choose one of the two. And in this case, I've chosen debt N. So we're going to expand the NP. We're going to rewrite it as debt N. And now let's try to expand the debt. So let's look at debt. Do we see any rules in our list which have debt on the left-hand side and something else on the right-hand side? And now we'll just choose one at random. We'll choose one of the lexical entries now for the category debt. So let's grab this one. This says the category debt can consist of the word that. So now I have the word that. Now let's turn to the N. Let's look at our rules and see what rules do we have which have N on the left-hand side. Well, we have the rule that says an N can consist of an adj followed by an N. We have the rule that says an N can consist of an N followed by a PP. Those are both recursive rules. We also have all the lexical entries. So we have that an N can consist of the word cat or an N can consist of the word mouse and so on. So let's just grab one randomly. We have that the category N can consist of the word person. So we have the person so far, that person rather. Okay, now we need to turn to the VP. And if you look at the rules, you'll notice there's a lot of different rules for what a VP can consist of. A VP can consist of an intransitive verb V, it can consist of a transitive verb TV, followed by an NP, and so on and so on. Let's actually grab this one. A VP can consist of a VP followed by ADV. That means that we expand it like this. So we have a VP followed by an ADV. Now, let's apply the VP rule again. We're going to look at all of our rules for VP, applying now to this second VP in the tree. And we can randomly grab the rule that says a VP can consist of an intransitive verb V. Now we're gonna to need to grab a rule for V. We'll grab a lexical entry. Let's use this one, slept. So the category V can consist of the word slept. And now the last thing that we have to do is expand the category adv for adverb. So let's look at our rules. Um, we have at the very bottom there, the category adv can consist of the word well, or the word furiously, or the word calmly, or badly, so on. So let's take badly. And there we've done it. We have generated a sentence by following the rules. We got that person slept badly. So you see what we did is at each point, we looked at one of the syntactic categories in the tree. And then we looked at the rules and we looked at what rules could expand that category. For that category, we looked at what the rules said that category can consist of. And we chose one randomly. That's how we generate a random sentence. Now this can be pretty fun. Uh, you can use this to generate all kinds of interesting sentences. Remember, this is turning the crank forward, so you're following the arrows. You're taking an S, expanding it into an NP, and so on. Uh, what I'd like you to do, for those of you watching, is um, just use these rules. Choose a different set of rules randomly, but use the rules starting with an S on top to generate a random sentence. And when you come up with a random sentence, leave it in the comments so we can all look at your sentences. It's possible to generate some pretty funny, pretty nonsensical sentences using these rules. But it should be the case that you don't generate anything ungrammatical. So if the rules are correct, that means you will not generate anything ungrammatical when you follow this procedure. So that's generation. Remember generation, turning the crank forward. Now we're going to do it in the reverse. We're going to do parsing. That's turning the crank backwards. Starting with a sentence, a list of words, you want to build the tree up so that you have S on top at the end. And what it's going to tell you is how would you have generated this sentence if you generated it using the rules. So here's an example. We start with a sentence. 
Here we have something like Sally thought the dog chased the furry cat. Okay, we're going to parse it. To parse it, the first thing we need to do is note the lexical categories for all the words. So Sally is a proper name. Thought is an SV, a sentential verb. Remember these kinds of verbs that we discussed last time. V is a determiner. Dog is a noun. Chased is a transitive verb. The is a determiner. Again, furry is an adjective. Cat is a noun. And now, what we need to do is look at the sequence of syntactic categories that we have and figure out what rule could have generated that sequence of syntactic categories. I'm going to start from the end of the sentence now. So the last two syntactic categories here are adj followed by n. And so what we're wondering now is what rule could have generated this? What rule could have generated an adj followed by an n? We look through our list. We say, is there any rule which has adj n on the right-hand side? In this case, there is. I already highlighted it. We have that the category n can consist of an adj followed by an n. So we have here that this adj n is actually just an instance of the category n. And we figured that out by looking at the rules. Now we continue. So, so far, what we have at the end of the sentence is a debt followed by an n. So take a look at the rules. Do you see any rules which have debt n on the right-hand side? What could have generated a debt n? What syntactic category consists of a debt followed by an n? Take a look at the rules. And you'll find that it is a noun phrase. A noun phrase can consist of a determiner followed by a noun. So that is the structure here. We have a determiner followed by a noun, and that noun in turn consists of an adjective followed by a noun. Now we'll continue parsing. So we want to now integrate the word chaste into this parse tree. So chaste is a transitive verb. So we look at our rules. Do we have any rules which generate TVNP? which generate a transitive verb followed by an NP. Do you see that in the rules anywhere? There it is. So it's a verb phrase. So we have now a verb phrase consisting of a transitive verb followed by a noun phrase. And we need to keep going. So what we have right now is a determiner, and then a noun, and then a VP, looking at the end of the sentence. So what can we do with that debt n? Again, that determiner followed by a noun, det n, is the category np, as indicated by the rule here. So that det n might have been generated by someone who started with an np and then decided to expand it using the rule that says an np can consist of a det followed by an n. So we have an np. Now what we have is an np followed by a vp, right? And what's that? What's an np followed by a vp? Well, it's the most important rule in English. That's a sentence. So that sentence, that category S, contains all the words, the dog chased the furry cat. That's a sentence. Great, but we still haven't finished parsing this entire sentence. So we've identified a sentence within the sentence, but we haven't yet parsed the entire sentence. Let's keep doing that. What we have so far is an SV followed by an S. And what is the rule? What is the rule which has SVS on the right-hand side? Can you find it? It's the rule that says a verb phrase VP can consist of an SV followed by an S. There it is. So applying that rule, we have that this is a verb phrase. Now we have the proper name Sally. We have a rule that says a noun phrase can consist of a proper name, like this. And finally, remember, what's the final rule we put on top? What is the symbol that's on the top of every tree? It's always S. And so now we're going to apply the top rule that says an S can consist of an NP followed by a VP. So we get an S, and we have successfully parsed the sentence. So parsing, running the machine in reverse. You can imagine if I had run the machine forward starting with S, I might have generated this sentence. Running the machine backwards tells us how. How is it that you might have generated this sentence? So parsing a sentence is an interesting exercise. It can get a little tricky. 
And so I want to give you a recipe here that you should follow when you're parsing a sentence. And I'll also give you some tips and tricks. The first thing you should do when you want to parse a sentence is first label all the categories for all the individual words. Write out their syntactic categories for the individual words. Second, find a sequence of categories that matches the right-hand side of a rule and which have not yet been matched by any rule. Three, draw a tree containing the, that sequence of symbols with the left-hand side of that rule on top. And then repeat that until you have a single tree that covers all the words in the sentence and it has an S for sentence on the very top. So we're going to do two more examples of parsing. Here's the first sentence we're going to parse. Mary likes the old photo of Bob. All right. So remember, the first step in parsing is to write out the syntactic categories for all the individual words. So Mary, that's a proper name. Likes, that's a verb, but what kind of verb is it? It's a transitive verb, TV, because it takes an object. The is a determiner. Old is an adjective. Photo is a noun. Of is a preposition. Bob is a proper name. OK. Now remember, the next step is we want to identify some sequence of categories and see if they match the right-hand side of any rule. And I'm going to give you a trick. This is not something that always works. It's something that usually works when you're parsing English. You should start from the end of the sentence and work your way backwards. It just happens to be the case that when you're parsing English, things are going to go more smoothly for you, trust me, if you start from the end of the sentence rather than from the beginning. So let's look at the end of the sentence. So we have P prop N. Huh. Is that a sequence of words which matches anything? Is that the right-hand side of any rule? P prop N? Now we look through the rules. No. It doesn't really match. How about just prop N on its own? Well, yeah. We see that the category NP can consist of a prop N. So we now take that rule and we draw a tree with the left-hand side of that rule on top. So the left-hand side of that rule was NP, and NP can consist of a proper name. Okay, so now we have a sequence of categories that ends with P and then NP. What is that? Does that match any rule? Do you see PNP? on the right-hand side of any rules? Take a look. Well, yeah, we have that a PP can consist of a P followed by an NP. Great. So that is a PP. Good. Now we have NPP at the end. We have an N followed by a PP. Does that match any rules? Do you see anything that can consist of an N followed by a PP? Take a look. It's toward the bottom of the list. Yeah, an N can consist of an N followed by a PP, like this. Good. And let's keep looking. We now have an adjective followed by an N. What could that be? Is there anything that can consist of an adj followed by an N? And yes, it's another N. Good. And now we have a debt followed by an N. What is that? A debt followed by an N, what is the syntactic category that can consist of a debt followed by an N? It's an NP. So we have an NP. Now, we have a TV followed by an NP. What is that? Take a look at the rules. What is the category that can consist of a TV followed by an NP? It's toward the top. A verb phrase, VP, can consist of a TV followed by an NP. So that's a verb phrase. Now, finally, we take a look at the very beginning. We have another prop N that is an NP. Now what we have is an NP and a VP. What is that? That is the rule at the very top. A sentence S can consist of an NP followed by a VP. So that's it. We parsed the sentence. 
And that was a pretty uneventful parse, right? It was pretty straightforward. We just turned the crank. We started at the end of the sentence. We worked our way backwards. And it was pretty easy to identify the rules that would eventually lead us to a single tree with S on top. Cool. So that's a simple example. What I'm going to do now is a slightly more challenging example. So how about this? How about the following sentence? The ship in the river sank slowly. All right, we're going to parse this. First step of parsing is to identify the syntactic categories for all the individual words. So here's what they are. V is a determiner, ship is a noun, in is a preposition, V is a determiner, river is an N, sank is a verb, but what kind of verb is it? Does it take an object? No, there's no object. So this is a intransitive verb V, and then slowly is an adverb. Okay, now we'll parse. So what do we have? At the end, we have a V followed by an adv. Does that match any rule? Hmm. No, not really, not yet. We don't have any rules that have V adv on the right-hand side. So uh, we're going to have to be a little more creative. Let's take a look at the V. The V there, is there any rule that just has V on the right-hand side? Well, there is. There's the second rule. A verb phrase can consist of an intransitive verb v. So we'll just indicate that rule like this. Okay, now let's try again with the adverb. Do we have any rules that describe a vp followed by an adv? Do we have that rule? Take a look. vp followed by adv. Yeah, we have that a vp can consist of a vp followed by an adv, by an adverb. So now we have a vp. Good. Okay. Now let's take a look. We have an N. Before that we have a debt. So debt N, what is that? This should be pretty quick for you. Whenever you see debt N, determiner noun, you can be pretty sure it's just going to be a noun phrase in English, right? Okay, so debt N is a noun phrase. NP. And so now you think, aha! I have a noun phrase followed by a verb phrase. It's a sentence, right? There you go, there's the sentence. The river sank slowly. Okay, but remember, the goal is to parse this entire sentence. And the ship and the river sank slowly. We've parsed the part that says the river sank slowly, but what about the rest? So what we're left with now is a P followed by an S. And is there anything in our rules that has a P followed by an S? No, it's not there. So this is not going to work. You're actually going to have to backtrack here. There's no way that I can build an entire tree, a single tree with S on top of the entire tree that has this as a part of it. I'm going to have to backtrack. This was not the right move. I'm going to have to backtrack and try again. All right, so we have in the river, that's a P followed by an NP. And what is that? What is uh, the category that can consist of a P followed by an NP. Take a look. Well, it's a PP, a prepositional phrase. So that's actually a PP. Then we have an N followed by a PP. And what is that? What is an N followed by a PP? Well, that's another N. Now we have a debt followed by an N. And what is that? That's an NP. And now, at last, we have an NP, and we have a VP, and we can apply the rule on top that says an S can consist of an NP followed by a VP, like this. So the sentence has an NP, which is the ship in the river, and then it has a VP, which is sank slowly. All right? So the point of this example is that when you're parsing, it's not necessarily just a matter of turning the crank. When you're turning the crank backwards in this way, you might have to backtrack a bit. You're going to have to do a bit of thinking in order to figure out how does this sentence really break into parts. It needs to be one single tree with S on top of it. OK. So 
So those were some examples of generation and parsing. What I want to talk about now is some issues that come up when we try to do uh, generation and especially parsing. And one of these issues is ambiguity, and there's two major kinds of ambiguity that we need to talk about. The first kind is lexical ambiguity. So let's take a look. Here is a sen sentence, which is grammatical, we love Bob. Okay. Here's another sentence. We know the power of love. Huh. Well, that's interesting. So in the first sentence, love is pretty clearly a transitive verb. But in the second sentence, it's pretty clearly a noun, right? So we have that the word love can be either a transitive verb or a noun. What's going on? The way we would describe this is by having a rule that says that the category transitive verb can consist of the word love. And there's also another rule which says the category noun can consist of the word love. So there's actually two different rules that generate the same word. There's a rule that gives you love as a verb, and there's another rule that gives you love as a noun. And this is what we call lexical ambiguity. Here's another example. We can say something like the present situation is dangerous, and there it's pretty clear that present is an adjective. But in a sentence like this, Bob gave me a cool present. Present is clearly a noun. So we have rules that say like the category noun can consist of the word present, and also the category adjective can consist of the word present. We also see this in verbs. So here's a grammatical sentence, Sally devoured the cake. It's grammatical, there's no problem. How about this, Sally devoured? doesn't quite work, right? When you hear Sally devoured, you're waiting to hear what she devoured. So this is a fragment, it's ungrammatical, it's not a sentence in English. So we have a rule that says a uh, transitive verb can consist of the word devoured. Now, here's an ungrammatical sentence, Sally died the cake. It's, you don't know what this possibly could mean. This is nonsense, it's ungrammatical in English but Sally died without an object is okay. So we have a rule that says that an intransitive verb can consist of the word died. So what we see here is that there's a certain set of transitive verbs and another set of intransitive verbs. But now what about this? Sally ate the cake. That's grammatical, so ate must be a transitive verb. How about this, Sally ate? That's also okay. So you, you want to know, like, um, has Sally eaten yet? You say, yes, Sally ate. That's grammatical. So it looks like this verb ate could be a transitive verb or an intransitive verb. Again, this is lexical ambiguity because we have the same word ate, but it could be a manifestation of different syntactic categories. It could be a TV or it could be a V. So the word eight belongs to two different syntactic categories. It could be transitive, could be intransitive. The very many words belong to multiple syntactic categories in this way. This is a property of all human languages. And that is lexical ambiguity. That's when there is one word which could be generated by multiple different syntactic categories. Another example, the word this could be a determiner like in this car. Or it could be a pronoun, as when I say something like, this is interesting. So in that case, you would have a rule that says the category debt can consist of the word this, and another separate rule which says the category pro for pronoun can consist of the word this. Now, the other kind of ambiguity that comes up, especially when you're doing parsing, is what's called structural ambiguity. So the best way to illustrate structural ambiguity is with an example, like the following. I'm going to give you some sentences, and I'm going to parse them, and you're going to see that there's actually two different ways to parse the sentence. And those two different ways of parsing the sentence correspond to two different possible meanings of the sentence. So let's take a look. We have Mary saw the mouse in the house. 
Okay, we're going to parse it. And remember, first step of parsing is to identify the syntactic categories as best as you can, remembering that there might be lexical ambiguity. Mary is a proper name. Saw is a transitive verb. The is a determiner. Mouse is a noun. In is a preposition. The is a determiner. House is a noun. Mary saw the mouse in the house. And you should already see how there might actually be two different meanings, at least two different meanings for the sentence. All right. So we'll parse it from the end. Let's say we have det n, so that's going to be a noun phrase. Now we have a p followed by an np. Look at your rules. Are there any rules that could generate a p followed by an np? Well, yes. That would be a prepositional phrase. OK, now do we have any rules that would generate an n followed by a pp? Yes, we do. We have a rule that says the category n can consist of an n followed by a pp. Now we have a determiner followed by a noun, so that's an np. We have a tv transitive verb followed by an np, so that is going to be a verb phrase. Now we have the proper name Mary, that's a noun phrase. We're left with a noun phrase and a verb phrase, and so we're done. This is one way of parsing the sentence. One way of parsing the sentence. But as we're going to see, there's another way of parsing the sentence. So we're going to call this parse number one. But now we're going to look at parse number two. So let me just copy this stuff. We'll go down here. Mary saw the mouse in the house, still the same syntactic categories, but we're going to parse it now in a different way. So again, um, let's start from the end. So at the end, we have det n, that's a noun phrase. We have pnp, that's a pp. But now, let's do it differently than we did last time. So we have the mouse, that's an np, right? And we have tvnp. Well, that's a verb phrase, right? If you look at the third rule in the list. So that's a verb phrase. Now we have a vp followed by a pp. And if you look at the rules, we have a rule that says a verb phrase can consist of a vp followed by a pp. So that's all one big happy verb phrase. All right. Now I have prop n, that's a noun phrase, and I have vp. I apply the rule that says a sentence can consist of an NP followed by a VP, and I'm done. This is another parse of the sentence. It's a single tree. It has S on top. It follows the rules. This parse is just as correct as this other parse, right? So I'll call this parse 2. Notice the difference here. So in parse 2, think about the structure here. In parse 2, this prepositional phrase in the house was part of this bigger VP. It was part of this bigger whole VP, right? But in parse number one, let's just scroll back up to parse number one. The prepositional phrase in the house here, that was part of the noun phrase. That was part of this noun phrase, the mouse in the house. So in this first parse, we say that the prepositional phrase modifies the noun mouse. We say that the prepositional phrase attaches to the NP to form the mouse in the house. And in parse number two, we say the prepositional phrase modifies the verb and attaches to the verb phrase saw the, to form the verb phrase saw the mouse in the house. So I'd like you to think about the different meanings for these sentences. Mary saw the mouse in the house. So what could this mean? Is the mouse in the house or is Mary in the house? Maybe Mary is standing in the house and she sees a mouse outside through a window. In that case, it would be true that her seeing takes place in the house. And that would correspond to this meaning, this structure right here. So this structure says, this structure has the meaning that 
the seeing happens in the house. The seeing event happens in the house. So Mary is in the house. She sees a mouse. Maybe that mouse is outside. Okay, how about parse number one? In this case, the in the house part was modifying the noun mouse. So what did Mary see? She saw the mouse in the house. What did she see? The mouse in the house. This is a constituent. The meaning of this parse is something like the mouse is in the house. Maybe Mary is outside and she's looking into the house and seeing a mouse on the inside. So that would be the meaning of this parse. Mary saw the mouse in the house. So do you see how these two different parses actually correspond to two different meanings of the sentence? Is it the mouse that's in the house or is it Mary that's in the house? In this parse where we've put in the house inside the noun phrase, then it's the mouse who's in the house. In this other parse where we put in the house as part of the verb phrase, that means that it is Mary who is seeing who is inside the house. So this kind of structural ambiguity is very, very common in all human languages. All human languages have this kind of structural ambiguity. And it leads to a lot of entertaining situations. So structural ambiguity means that the same sequence of words admits multiple different parse trees. And those different parse trees correspond to different interpretations of the sentence. The examples we've seen so far are examples of a special kind of ambiguity called PP attachment ambiguity, because the question is, how does the PP fit in with the rest of the sentence? you'll find that very many naturally occurring sentences have this kind of structural ambiguity. If you start paying attention, start listening for it, you'll notice that nearly everything we say has some kind of structural ambiguity in it, like this. It's kind of like visual illusions. So if you've studied visual illusions, you might have seen things like this. So is this two faces looking at each other? Or is this a vase? Is it two black faces on a white background? Or is it a white vase on a black background? You can see it either way. In the same way, in a sentence like, Mary saw the mouse in the house, you can see it either way. You can see it with one parse or the other parse, one meaning or the other meaning. So this leads to jokes like, I'm a linguist. I love ambiguity more than most people. OK, so do you see the two different possible meanings of this sentence? You see, what is, what, what is it exactly um, that this person um, likes more than most people? So um, now you would be able to actually parse this kind of a sentence and see how the two different possible meanings of this sentence correspond to two different syntactic structures. There's all kinds of other funny examples like um, these newspaper headings, like enraged cow injures farmer with ax. So what are the two possible meanings here? It could be that there is an enraged cow that was holding an axe and chasing a farmer. Or it could be that an enraged cow injured a farmer who was holding an axe. Those are two different interpretations. And if you parse this sentence, you would find that there are two parses corresponding to those two different interpretations. Stolen painting found by a tree. Let me see a few different meanings to this here. It sounds, at the first, when you read it, you think it's this sort of very funny meaning, a stolen painting was somehow um, discovered by the action of like a tree who was a detective, like the tree was searching for a stolen painting and it found it. It's probably not what this means, right? It probably means that the stolen painting was found physically next to a tree, but there's an ambiguity there. There's an ambiguity there which you now know how to describe using syntax. Two sisters reunited after 18 years and check out counter. So you see, first of all, do you see what the funny meaning is? And then do you see what the intended meaning is? Both of those meanings are possible parses of this sentence. Squad helps dog bite victim. So there is a somewhat shocking funny meaning here. And then there's the intended meaning. And if you think about it, you can see both. And if you parse the sentence, you would find, oh, there's two different parses. And that those correspond to the two different meanings. 
British left waffles on Falkland Islands. This one's a bit more challenging. It's a bit, a bit more challenging to figure out what this is supposed to mean, but you can do it. So how to parse a sentence. I just want to conclude with this procedure for parsing a sentence. You start by labeling your syntactic categories. Next, you find a sequence of categories that matches the right-hand side of some rule and which hasn't yet been matched by any rule. Then you draw a tree with the left-hand side of that rule on top of it. Then you repeat, possibly backtracking, until you have a single tree that covers all the words in the sentence.